Hi! Um, just a quick reminder that anything you see in today's video was filmed before we went into lockdown. So I think we've got a couple more car reviews and then we're going to start going into other stuff. But anyway, really hope you enjoyed today's video. Make sure you tell me in the comments what you think, if you've got any suggestions or if you've got any experiences of the Allegro yourself. Right, let's crack on with this video. Hi guys, it's Steph from iDriver Classic and today I'm back in one of the most requested cars that I've ever had come across on the channel, more so than Mini, more so than anything at all. It's the very humble 1970s classic car, the Austin Allegro. In today's video, I'm going to show you around the outside of the car, I'm going to show you the inside of course, we're going to take a walk through the dash and then we're going to take this amazing car up for a drive. And we're also going to have a chat with the owner, Josh, who is my boyfriend so not only does he suffer by owning an allegro but he's also got to suffer with me too how much can a man bear we'll find out when we have a chat with him right let's start by having a look around the outside of the car i imagine that as you sit down to watch this video you've probably already got an opinion on the allegro a car i've rarely heard a bad thing about from owners in recent times but somehow nicknamed the all agro by the general public who don't know much about cars I'm going to give you a fair review today to offer you the chance to work out if the nickname is justified and spoiler it's not my favourite car in the 70s BL lineup, so it's a very fair review indeed. Now let's start this story by going all the way back to the 60s. The 1100 known as the ADO 16 had sold very well throughout the 60s, in fact topping bestseller lists in the UK for the decade and had sold over 2 million units. Buyers were, if we ignore the rust complaints, very happy with their medium-sized car. But more so than then, the world of car manufacturing was moving at a real pace, and with that, the successor to the ADO 16 had to be announced. With this in mind, when the Leyland takeover happened in 1968, Donald Stokes, the sales and service director of Leyland Motors Limited, announced there were no new models on the drawing board and decided with ADO 16 nearing the end of its shelf life, it was time to create a successor to fit that spot. And interestingly, it was also decided to do away with the badge engineering, which we discussed in the ADO 16 video, and time to determine separate brand identities for Morris and Austin. Whilst Morris was given the role of going up against Ford, they wanted to use the Austin name for the cars they deemed special, the cars which boasted the Leyland technological advancements. Initially, hopes were high for Project ADO 67, with talks of an ADO 16 facelift with a body style by Michelotti, but the idea was quickly dropped to make way for an entirely new car, and in a meeting held with BMC dealers in 1968, Donald Stokes announced a completely new model policy for the next five years. Starting with the styling of the Allegro, the looks are completely credited to one man, Harris Mann, the chief stylist who had come over from Ford. And when the Allegro was being pitched, Mann's design was one of four or five on display and looked really different to the car we see before us today. Sadly, the design got tweaked and tweaked and tweaked again, with considerations for the car having to take on existing engines, gearboxes and a heater which had been designed at massive cost and then of course the E-Series engine which had to be accommodated. So all in all, there was no way the original artist sketch could be even adhered to in any way, shape or form. So what did this mean for the car? Well, I'll keep it simple. It meant the bonnet line had to be raised, the curves in the initial design were exaggerated, losing that vibe of sleekness that we'd seen of the car on the drawing board and the body shape was tweaked to address customer concerns of the ADO 16s around the underbonnet access and boot space. The car of receiving so many tweaks made it look really bulky and, and dumpy and just really not what man had imagined at all. And the seats didn't help either because they were made thicker, which took away some of that interior space. Essentially, the car was kind of designed to look a bit like the Austin Princess that's far more accurate to what man had drawn up and this allegro that you see here before us today was signed off at the cost of an incredible 21 million pounds however despite everybody saying hey wait a minute no one at the top was particularly worried because they felt that the public would really gel with the one-off standout in the car park styling that they felt was the future of austin however this is stuff you hear all the time so let's discuss the good bits about the allegro first off 
When the car was designed, it was very usable, and it's still very usable today. With a top speed of 79 miles per hour for your 1100, 87 for your 1300 manual, and 81 for your 1300 auto, with a touring MPG of 36 to 40 miles per gallon, dropping to around 33 to 38 on the 1300 auto, the Allegro isn't a bad choice if you're looking for a fairly economical classic car. And I've been informed that these figures are pretty accurate um, for around town, and Josh has said that on a long motor away drive he's even achieved 48 miles per hour which is better than my 1300 marina which is averaging 31 to 35 and secondly let's discuss suspension because that's a big thing so the car's equipped with hydro gas which when working correctly as you see in this car is said to resemble riding on a magic carpet the hydro gas system was designed by alex Moulton and it did away with the rubber used on the hydroelastic suspension and introduced nitrogen filled units which offered a more consistent ride and meant the car hugged the road with minimal body roll. And although you hear a lot of bad things said about the Allegro, something interesting they note in the service manual is that they'd recognised some of the mechanical pitfalls of the ADO 16 and made a few changes maybe not spotted by the driver. So the car design saw the disappearance of the rubber bushed inner joints while a tubular rear suspension mounting eliminated the rear subframe, which had been a famous rust trap on not only ADO 16 but the Mini 2 and was said to cause more MOT failures than any other part of the car. In addition to this, the cars were rust proof in the factory, given extra drain holes and plastic splash guards were fitted to protect the A-posts. Another very small detail to note is the upgrading of the wiring loom to a Fabro strip main wiring loom, which meant in simple terms all wires are bonded to a backing sheet, leaving the full length of the cables visible and massive plus point when tracing wiring concerns. Now despite all these fantastic upgrades and what you'll see is a pleasurable smooth driving experience with good comfort, the buying public and journalists just weren't keen and a car which should have sold really well in fact only sold just over 600,000 units which seems really unjust considering how good this car actually is. Now let's talk a little bit about forecourt choice because unlike ADO 16 which only offered your 1100 and 1300 you get a little bit more with the Allegro so it's made from 73 through to 82 and your engine choices on your series one as you see here included the 1100 and 1300 but as production progressed you could have chosen from anything from a 1.7 e series and of course the Vanden Plus 1500 and 1700 cars and as for transmission you could have gone for manual or auto and on your body shape you could have gone for a two or four door saloon or the rather odd looking estate and you'll notice the lineup is missing a hatchback it was expected these customers would look to a maxi which actually seems quite short-sighted now when the car production was replaced by the maestro yeah it was a good sensible choice but i do think it lacked some of the zany standout features of the allegro and although the Allegro is a pretty Marmite car looks wise, I do think it holds up in terms of engineering and safety considerations. And it's definitely a car worth giving more than a second glance. But be quick if you want to own one because there are allegedly less than 500 examples left. And it seems that once they're bought nowadays, they all seem to find loving long term homes. And remember, if you're watching this video because you own an Allegro or you're looking to buy one, then... I'll give you the advice on joining the owners club because I've met quite a few of the owners and all of them have been really friendly and there's even a members only parts supply which is great for keeping these cars going because like a lot of cars of Sierra parts aren't readily available massively. Now that we've had a bit of a natter about the car and its history, I'm going to try and give you a bit of a feel for what it's like to be behind the wheel. But before we talk through the dash and all the rest of it, let's have a chat with Josh, who's owned this car for an incredible seven years. And for naysayers out there, this has been his daily car for seven years, which is perhaps why it doesn't look concourse. But I had to show you guys because I love showing you cars that people use on the regular and giving you a much more realistic feel for what the cars actually look like. So let's go and catch up with Josh. Yet again, I have pinned Josh down and borrowed one of his cars for a review. And this time it's his daily car of the last amazing seven years, the Austin Allegro. It is, yes. Now you didn't want me to take it. So I want to tell you why I wanted to take this car out, but tell me why you didn't want me to take this car out. I was reluctant because it, it's in need of a little work uh, now. Um, I have... Um, very ashamedly been neglecting it a bit um, lately um, after I put it on the road seven years ago now is the time 20,000 miles and seven, those seven years later the, the jobs that need doing on all cars then 
now need doing on this. So it needs a new exhaust. Uh, I need to tidy up the bodywork, uh, the brake calipers need uh, attention at the front. Uh, just things like that. I prefer to present my cars in fighting trim. Um, Steph isn't so particular, but right. <laughs> Right, I am not as particular because number one, I use my cars every day and I get like really awful people in these massive SUVs that are too mm. big for modern parking spaces they bashing are, yeah, into my doors seen, anyway. Yeah. So I think, well, mm. pff, whatever. And also, this car's gorgeous. And mm. I think that you've been really harsh about it because I think a lot of people, um, I mean, I hope that people watching this channel aren't going to be mm. as negative, but I think out and about in the wild, a lot mm. of people are very negative mm. and say stuff like, oh my God, I didn't know that a BL car could even mm. last one winter. Let Seven. So it's really nice to Oh play. yes, well I will always rigorously defend <laughs> these cars, as you know, because these are what started me off, really. Yeah. It's the, the, the first ones I had. I've had, this is my third Allegro, I know the good cars, uh, very well engineered, very reliable and economical. Um, so yeah, I, I have no bad things to say about them, really. Obviously there are good and bad points in all cars. But these mainly are things, let me see, on this, the Allegro, the only, the, my only real criticism is that damn exhaust uh, manifold to downpipe clamp, uh, which always blows. Really? Yeah, because it was all right on, the arrangement was all right on the inline mm. cars, so the A35, the Morris Minor, the A40, but when... Uh, they, they put the engine in transversely into the Mini, the 1100 and ultimately the Allegro uh, they, they only used a clamp a pressed steel clamp Oh right, what, and it's just not up to the job? Yeah well, It, was, oh, it right. was either a pressed steel or it should be a cast clamp uh, either or but it doesn't do the job because the torque reactions of the engine it's pulling it like that you know, when your exhaust pipe is fixed so I don't that know, half actually, the time and just driving my car really stressfully because yeah. I'm already late. I'm just getting into the technical engineering details there. No, it's nice. There'll be yeah. people that appreciate that more than me waffling yeah. on about what it's like to drive. Yeah. Now, this isn't my favourite BL car, I will be honest, yeah. especially of the 70s. My favourite's yeah. probably the Marina. Yeah. Is this your favourite BL car? Um, that's a good question. I... Hmm, it's probably... This probably epitomises them more than anything else because this was Donald Stokes's baby and this is one of the first fruits of the the BL Yeah um, What would you call it? The, the BL Merger? Yeah Great yeah. Birth? Yes I don't know I mean, it's not really I'm struggling uh... for words there well, it's, I, I prefer the marina. I just think that the styling is more me. But I do mm. think that one of the nicest things about the Allegro mm. is that there are so many cars, 70s cars, or mm. the amount of people that walk up to me that are like, oh, is that a Ford? It says mm. Morris Marina on the back, and people are like, is that a Ford? Mm. No. Mm. Whereas I guess with this, mm. people walk straight up to it mm. and they know it's an Allegro. Mm. Like, you look at it for the front, it's mm. definitely, definitely yeah. an Allegro. Yeah, there's no mistake in these cars. Whereas... It's good that you're having your opinion on this because you will go into it with a female mind, which is no, well, that's just what it is. Whereas <laughs> I'm going into it with not necessarily a man's mind, yeah. but this engineering mindset. Uh, yeah. That's because the field I work in, uh, yeah. I'm very interested in the technical side of things. I just want to know how fast something's going to go and if it's going to get me there reliably which is something actually <laughs> we should probably but, mention yeah. that this car has been very reliable for you. It has yes yes I, I did have a little trouble with the original engine that at 32,000 miles it did develop a top end rattle or knock which I think was the little end mm. um, who knows how that happened it, it sort of developed after towing another car yeah. out of some trouble I, d I don't know I don't know what happened because I've never stripped that engine because we've got another spur one from a scrapyard which turned out to be a fantastic unit that yeah. it's, it's just been superb that's yeah. the one in the car now 
Right, so I guess we should take this out for a drive. Um, would you find my final question to you before we head off is is would you recommend the because there's a lot of people that hear bad stories mm. from brothers uncles dogs cousins neighbor mm. who says oh you know it's the all aggro mm. would you say that that's an unfair nickname for this car i would there are a lot of these urban myths that uh, still persist to this day and they're not all true certainly there's no danger of the rear screen popping out if you jack it up in the wrong place. Um, they weren't banned from the Mersey Tunnel, uh, etc. etc. Uh, the only thing that was did hold any truth was the rear wheels did used to fall off the very early what was cars. That? <laughs> yeah. Imagine going to work. Oh, yeah. sorry, I'm late because my rear wheel fell off. They did, and that was because. Uh, the wrong size washer was fitted to the uh, rear wheel um, hook. God. Yeah, so when the when the wheel bearing failed, this washer wasn't big enough to cover the outer race, so the wheels fell off. But that was quickly uh, put right. <laughs> of course it was, because yeah. otherwise thousands of people would have died. Yeah. Ridiculous. Right, I'm in the driver's seat. Can I pitch the keys off you? You are in the driver's seat, yes. <laughs> I do think it would be a good idea to do some sort of... Uh, BL uh, question and answer session because <laughs> there is much I would like to say about the marina and not all of it good either. Right, well, I'm never going to have you on the channel again. <laughs> <laughs> right, come on, let's go. Now, before we have a look through the dash, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the trim level because I actually think this is quite interesting. So, it's something that BL did right through to the days of the Metro, and in fact, by the point of the Metro, I think it was a lot more pronounced than it is here. But there are a few differences on this as you would have got to the next level up which was super deluxe so this was base level called deluxe and then the next level up was super or super deluxe so on your deluxe level you've got your seats just as standard but on your super deluxe you would have been able to recline those seats and over here you see the door cappings you might have seen this when we were looking round. These are actually painted and then your door card starts here. Whereas on your supers, they come all the way up. So on my on my marina, actually, they go all the way up. Um, so my marina is super deluxe, I believe. Um, and then I'll bring you round to the mirror. So this is a little bit different. So we're almost working our way up before we work our way down. The mirror here is tinted glass, I believe, with a dimmer up. Like you're able to kind of... Anyway, you may be able to move it around, but the mirror was slightly different without that tinted glass in for your super deluxe. And then as we work our way down the car, we've got the dash. Now the dash in this is metal, whereas in your super deluxe, you would have had a foam dash. And then I'll bring you right down to the floor. So as we look on the floor, you'll notice that we've got rubber matting, black rubber matting. However, if you'd paid a little bit more and gone for your super deluxe, you would have been able to get carpets in the car. So just a few changes, but I thought for those of you that like to know the real ins and outs, I thought that you might find that quite interesting. Now, as always, we're gonna talk through the inside of the car and we'll start over here and we'll work all the way over to here. So first of all, you've got your heat vents over here, um, the door handles, which they use on so many different things they had them on the tr7s i think they had the same handles on the maxi they had them on quite a few things actually um they're slightly different on the metro slightly different and then over here we've got an ashtray for the discerning smoker and we've got our heater controls over here and of course i do love this chocolate co colored molded plastic when it's offset against the Harvest Gold paint. I think it is real peak 1970s. We've got a retrofitted cigar lighter over here. We've got the radio. <clears throat> excuse me we've got the radio which has been fitted now this is a retrofit so this came from ne the netherlands if you were going to get an original one it would have had a unipart on it or the name of the marks whether that was triumph or whatever so this is retrofitted so this is medium wave and this is fm but as i said this radio came from the netherlands so instead of putting fm they have a u on and uh, over here we've got the heated rear screen option you've got your lights I love these little drawings. They look like the Smash Aliens, actually. Um, this is your speaker. 
we've got a blanking plate over here and I just want to go quiet for a second so you can hear this because this is um, your hazards. The noise of that is quite reassuring actually. And then I'll bring you over here. So over here we've got Speedo. So we're just gonna get the camera back in line. We've got the Speedo over here. You've got your petrol gauge here. Hold on, we might have to just swing round. We've got the petrol gauge. So we've got the petrol gauge and we've got the speed. I mean, let's shield that off for you. Sorry, the lighting. I mean, summer is both a blessing and a curse for filming. So you've got your petrol to the left and you've got your temperature gauge to the right. And you might be wondering what all these are. They're just your warning lights. And then I'm going to, we're going to flim back round again. And we've got the steering wheel. Now you may be wondering why we haven't got that standard Cortex steering wheel. Well, this is, a, I'm going to get very anoraki now. This is a 1975 car and in 74 they started phasing out the Cortex steering wheel and they moved then on into 75 with the rounded steering wheel so they started phasing out 74 but didn't announce it till 75 because otherwise you would have had people that could instantly look at a car in a forecourt and go well that's been hanging around a while so they kind of waited for the majority of that stock to disappear and then they said oh we're bringing in the round steering wheel now if you recognize it then you're probably a bit of a BL aficionado because this is actually the same steering wheel that is on the Marina. Um, I don't know what the Maxi has got. I really like the little whirlpool in the middle. And then you've, well, plug hole, sorry. Now you've got, um, you've got all your controls over here as well. I think they're the same as, God, I drive the Marina and the Metro on and off so much. I can never remember which one's got which. It's the same as either the Marina or the Metro, and it's it's um, handed the same as well because it's different for either the Metro or the Marina. One of them's got indicators on the other side. But anyway, on this side, you've got your wipers and your washers, and over here, you've got... So we come in, just show that off. There you go, you should be able to see. You've got a horn, and you've got your indicators, and you've got your flasher as well. So just before we head off, um, I'm actually going to beep this horn that's quite cute really it sounds like a noddy car anyway before uh, before i start the car up and i show you the um uh, the gearbox what i'm going to do is um i'm actually going to do a bit of a beehive test and let you know how well my hair fits in this car and uh, whether i think it's suitable or not now an unofficial test whenever i take out a car is can i fit my hair in it and um compared to some of the 80s and 90s cars where it's that kind of like staticky foamy material this is actually a bit like quite a smooth vinyl which means that my hair doesn't stick to it however the roof isn't quite as high as i would like it to be and i know that i'm having quite a bad hair day today so my hair isn't that high um but i just don't think this roof is high enough for my hair um and you're supposed to have to get a bowler hat on in these cars. There was even an advert about it. There was also an advert about how the Allegro's got room, plenty of room for five, with these amazing dancing girls with legs up to their armpits. So, look, the 70s was a wild time, but I can't get my hair in this car. I still like it, though. Okay, so we wanted to show you the, the gearbox. It's pretty simple and straightforward, but again, we have got that lift to reverse. So I'll show you. I put my foot all the way down on the clutch, and we come across, we go up into first, down into second, across, up into third, down into fourth, and we lift to get into reverse, and we come across like that, and that's reverse. So we thought we'd start the car up, and uh, we're going to try and show you the dials going up, but um, it's that sunshine again, just so difficult. We've been trying to get it in the shade all morning, um, trying to film it. Right, so you can see there, you can see some of your lights coming on. Give that a rev. Let me open the window so you can hear it a bit better. Sounds lovely. Now let's have a look under the bonnet while it's running.
let's pop this bonnet down and we'll go out for a drive in her. Now usually um, I would chat to you as we set off but I want you to hear as we go through the gears. should have 
steering wheel on it and not caught it. Um, I'm trying to think what else really that I should mention. I mean, you know, as I've said to you, it's got great visibility. It's got a great driving position. You don't feel like you're massively off, like in the Metro where the pedals are massively offset to one side. Um, it would be very easy to learn to drive in, I think, because your gearbox is very easy to master. It's an easy car to park with almost 100% visibility as you go round and the mirrors of an adequate size I mean we've not got a mirror on this side but it's something you could easily put on because I've seen blanket plates there so yeah do I think the Allegro deserves the bad reputation that it's got absolutely not do I think I'd pick one not really sure but but and there's a big but here I do think the comfort when I'm driving it the comfort when I'm driving it the speed because it's a nippy little thing to say it's only a only got that 1098 same as the Morris Minor underneath um, yeah I, w I think I would recommend it for somebody else but I think for me I'll probably stick with my marina now uh, this would be the last thing that I uh, I probably get filmed for a little while but we've got plenty of videos in the interim anyway to keep us going um, Josh is going to start filming some of the stuff that he's doing with the garage so that you guys can see a little bit of tech on the channel because I thought that would be quite a nice addition to what's going on with the car reviews and adventures and holidays and stuff just to add a different angle and um, we've got plenty of show footage from last year so whilst we may not get to any shows this year we can certainly reminisce with uh, the highlights of some of the previous years. Now I really hope you've enjoyed this video, it's been good fun to make, um, slightly stressful because you always want to do justice to a car that belongs to some, somebody you care about, um, but anyway yes I hope you like it, we're going to be featuring the Allegro a little bit more as 